Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, without wasting even a second, um, so glad to have you all here. Uh, the volunteers for the seminar series next uh, semester, please let us know. Um, uh, to get the, the story started, um, very glad to have uh, Dr. Kehan Patmanglish <laughs> to to come uh, give a talk. Uh, I'll hand it over to him so that we get you know we get started. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, sorry for uh, sorry to, for my side. No, no problem. <laughs> so I mean, we keep talking about uh, um, big data, but I guess like your trust on us computer scientists goes down and stuff. Anyway, so um, so today I'm going to talk about a uh, little of my past research and uh, ongoing research. My research is in the intersection of uh, machine learning medical image analysis and uh, bioinformatics. Uh, more specifically, I've worked toward uh, joint statistical analyzing of imaging data and genetic data. So today I'm going to show you part of the, 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 the work I've done back in MIT and uh, Harvard and continue that DBMI in the University of uh, Pittsburgh. So over the past uh, five years, uh, U.S. government has spent around $500 million on two big initiatives, Brain uh, Initiative and Precision Medicine. And whether the specific target of these two initiatives is specifically targeting brain diseases or general health, uh, imaging is an important part of it. However, we are moving toward a direction that we want to analyze and understand images alongside with other types of uh, information, such as medical record and, and genetic data. Um, I've worked on Alzheimer's diseases. Uh, uh, here I'm showing an example of the brain of the patient over the course of 10 years. And the area here represented by red is hippocampus responsible memory. And uh, the, the green area is ventricle. And as you see, that the, as person ages over the course of 10 years, this hippocampus shrinks while the areas uh, that contain fluid expand. One of the, the main themes of the Alzheimer's research uh, and also my research in the past has been how to characterize all of these regions automatically from brain images that characterize amount of atrophy in the brain that result in symptoms that we see as a lack of memory. So, so far we have, uh, in, in the community, we have made significant progress toward that direction. Now using medical images, we can, diag we can replicate the diagnosis of the doctors quite uh, accurately, and you can localize the, the location that tissues uh, undergoes atrophy. Here I'm showing you brain images from my past work. This is the sagittal direction and coronavirus in different slices, and the red areas represent the areas that are related to the disease and undergoes atrophy. And we can also detect the early onset of the Alzheimer's disease in a state called myocognitive impairment. So it's a good imaging biomarker. So this is why it. Um, us and many other researchers have uh, hypothesized that maybe the same information that helps us predict the diagnose the Alzheimer's disease maybe help us to go back to the underlying biology of the disease and uh, answer this question that where does Alzheimer's come in the first place? How the, the genetic variation between us increase or decrease uh, the risk of the Alzheimer's disease? That brings me to the, the landscape of interaction between imaging and genetics. Basically, in that context, we have the genetic data that the causal chain starts, and that it goes through a process, and at the end, at, uh, the, uh, we see the onset of the disease, but there are so much happening in between. And so this is uh, called endophenotype or intermediate phenotype, and imaging can be viewed as intermediate phenotype. And part of my research has been how to use this information to propagate it back to genetics. However, today I'm not going to talk about this direction, I'm going to talk about the reverse direction, which is basically using the known genetic marker of the disease to come up with better imaging biomarkers. And this is in the context of a different disease called chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease uh, is a disease caused by smoking, and uh, there's a big uh, risk factor for that, and it, it's a very heterogeneous, com a complicated disease that if I want to say the two main characteristics, characteristic of that are airway disease, which is uh, obstruction of the airway, and emphysema, which is obstruction of the 
emphasis. And today I'm going to talk about the emphysema mostly. So not everybody who is smoking at COPD, there are genetic factors into that. So very obvious examples of that is Pablo Picasso. This guy lived 90 plus years and smoked all the time. But uh, so there are genetic factors that uh, that basically make the person more uh, uh, to, to reflect COPD due to the, to the uh, uh, smoking. And COPD manifests itself in the image. Uh, so this destruction of this, uh, the, the tissue in, in the form of emphysema uh, sometimes happens close to the boundary of the lung, sometimes close, uh, scattered all over the places, and sometimes in the, uh, close to airways. And you can see that in the CT scan of the lung. So, for example, if we ask a, a, a radiologist to give us an annotation of the areas that they think these are the subtype of the diseases, uh, so this is how the lung of the patient may look like. So different colors represent the result of learning a predictor based on the annotation provided by the doctors, and color represent different, uh, what they call sub tissue type. So the red represents healthy, and different colors represent what they call visual. They, they view visually as different subtypes. However, there are several, there are variation among different annotators, and also what we see visually does not necessarily mean that those are related to the underlying epidemiological disease. So what uh, we want to do is that we want to relate it back to the genetic in a data-driven way. But before that, we have to answer this question: that is there any genetic signal that we can detect from the image? So there are a few works on this. For example, we show that even using the simplest imaging information, which is a uh, histogram uh, of the entire lung acquired from um, uh, CT scan, which is basically histogram of the, of the Huntsville unit, we can perform genetic association and find the genetic markers in the, in the low side that has been replicated, be related to, uh, to uh, uh, COPD. Also perform heritability analysis. How many people in the audience know about heritability analysis? Okay, so let me give you uh, a little bit of background, quick background on what heritability analysis is. In heritability analysis, we have uh, the vanilla version, we have univariate quantitative trait here represented as one. And we want to see how much of this quantitative trait is explained by the genetics, and that's what we call heritability. So what we do is that we put a mixed linear mixed model that in the linear mixed model uh, we have fixed effect that's your covariate. So for us, it's going to be age, gender, pack of smoking, and, uh, and a few principal component analysis to fix uh, the, the population structure such as race, and also the random effect, which is causing from the genetics. So basically, we are saying that from the variance of your univariate quantitative trait, that for example, can be anything that you want to study, how much of the variance are explained by this random effect? And that's what we call uh, So here I'm showing an example. So these are 4,600 uh, subjects, uh, all non-Hispanic whites. Uh, to account for, and we accounted for population structure. And FEV1 <coughs> is basically uh, the respira respiratory test that we use to diagnose the uh, I'm sorry, COPD disease. So this basically we ask a patient to, inspire, uh, to inhale air and forcefully ex exhale it within one second. So healthy population, a healthy person is able to exhale 80% and off. And uh, depends on how much of the obstruction that you have in the, in the lung and how much of the obstruction and destruction of the tissue you have, this value goes down. So we use, for example, this value as a quantitative trait uh, computer heritability, and that's around 31% heritability. FEV1 divided by this is another factor. So emphysema is, is a quantitative value, percentage of emphysema is a clinical value that people use in clinic for uh, calculating how much emphysema they have. So, Basically, what it, what it is is that when you inhale air, when there is a destruction of the tissue, so you see more of the uh, air in the CT scan of the lung, so the, the distribution of the Huntsville unit shifts more toward left. So what they do is that they apply a threshold, that this threshold is roughly the value of the air, count the number of voxels that have less than that uh, value of uh, threshold, and use as a quantitative. 
The, the log gas trap is exactly the same thing, the, the same thing when you exhale the entire air. And uh, so to just give you a rough idea of what 31% is, is it high, is it low? I'm just showing you here the height uh, as, a, as something that we know is heritable. So it's like height is around 53% heritable. So it's like 31%. It's not low, it's, I would say it's a, it's a, a high heritable. And there is also twin studies that show that even higher heritable. However, the problem is that we see about around 10% uh, gap here between the, the imaging trait that we use to, uh, uh, to quantify amount of uh, heritability aspect of the disease versus the FEV. FEV1, although characterizes the, the severity of the disease, is this mixture of emphysema and airway disease, and all uh, combined together, and you, you see that in FEV1. While we are, we are able to see it, um, uh, emphysema in an image, we are not able to characterize it using this simple uh, image characteristics. So the hypothesis is that maybe we can come up with better imaging biomarkers that close these gaps and uh, explain the heritability of the disease better. All these have different units, and there's a way you handle them. So, so these are these are different units, but what I'm showing here is the percentage. So it's like Basically, you uh, normalize it by dividing by variance of y. So it's, it's, it's one. Plus, scaling y does not change the heritability of this percentage. Because if you scale it, you take off. So, what we are after is basically on the, on the global level, you try to come up with a method that systematically connects imaging and genetic data with three aims. So, the first aim is that uh, can we find this core? co-occurring pattern of destruction in anatomy that reflects itself in the image. And the genetics that we, we measured by the genetic data and summarize the data with that. And are, uh, so basically, we want to have a way that instead of using the annotation provided by doctor, we can do it in the data tree. The second aim is to come up with better imaging biomarkers that explain heritability as of the disease. And the, the, the aim three is basically using this information, bring it back to the genetic, and find a new loci. So I'm going to talk mostly about N1 and show you a little bit of the result on N2 and N2. So I'm going to go over a method given. So the, the, the next few slides uh, is going to be a little bit um, um, uh, mathematical given my, my background. But we'll go back to exciting things after that. So, so let me give you what the data is. For each individual, we have CT scan of the lung. We subdivide the area of the lung to what we call super boxes or super pixels. So this is basically the areas which are, which are uh, spatially homogeneous. And then from each of these areas, given that we are uh, interested in characterizing emphysema, we extract local histogram. Because local histogram is very important to characterizing emphysema. Yes? How do you decide on the grading in the areas? So, okay, so super voxelization approach is basically local cluster. So there is always one parameter that you can say that, so this area has to be contiguous, uh, but you can make it bigger contiguous area. So there's a balance between whether you find the edge or you don't. So what we do here is that we run it for different uh, parameters and before running the analysis, show the doctor saying that which of this area makes sense to you more that you can continue this analysis with. Um, sure. Right. So then if you have like, uh, you get CT scans of uh, lungs that are of different sizes. I don't have a biology background, so I don't know if that's possible. Uh -huh. But if you have, uh, say, certain features in the lungs, like a pathway, uh -huh. and you have, I guess, different lung sizes, does it scale appropriately, or are you still breaking based on? Uh, no, so it's a good question. It does. So we are not assuming we are not assuming that there is one quote unquote atlas representation for all lungs. So we do it individually. So for example, if you have a bigger size of lung than me, you get more superboxes than I do. And this method is exactly to address that problem. Anyway, so from each of these superboxes, we extract uh, local image features that in this case is uh, histogram. And then we also have set of genetic uh, uh, loci that has been based coming from the literature, uh, and these are the locations that report to be related to the lung function of COP. So the way that is, so we are talking about genotype. 
who basically uh, copies from your mom and dad, if both of them are the same as a reference population, that location, you will have no minor any modification. If you have one of them is different, you get one. If both of them are different, or two. So the way that we represent it with our model is that we basically, in every location that we see a minor any modification, we use that symbol. So here, for example, in location one in this cartoonish subject, we have one minor any modification, we have one symbol L1. In location three, you have two minor modification. You have there are two symbols L3, and there is no minor modification in location two, so we don't see any. Other. In different subjects, it might be different. So putting it together, we basically view every subject as a bag of words that has visual words that's coming from the image and genetic words that's coming from the genetic. So, and we make this analogy between subject and a document. So now that I'm talking about this, so let me give a little bit further on, uh, on, on, on that analogy. So if you are given an, an article, for example, from New York Times, and there are so many words about, for example, White House, election, and so on and so forth, <coughs> a few words about um, NBA, that makes topic more about um, politics, maybe a little bit about the sport, and nothing about finance. So that's a way to basically summarize uh, a document into a lower dimensional representation. So we build on, on the top of that. So two balance notions in our case. So in, in our case for imaging data, these topics are a reoccurring thematic pattern that you, you, you see in the population. These are not known. You have to derive it from the data. And on the genetic side, these are so the, the, the patterns or the topic are the uh, basically chance of seeing minor identification in each of these locations. So putting things together, we have a pair of imaging and genetic topics that are shared across the population, and every individual gets his own proportion. So in this population, between this schematic, this guy gets 40% of topic one, 40% of topic two, and 20% of the topic three which is used to, do, to basically label uh, the, the location in the line. So none of these are known, so we have to derive it from the data. So, uh, so to perform this task, uh, task I uh, uh, basically build a graphical model. Uh, graphical model is a way to relate uh, the observed variables and unobserved variables and then structure and, and relationship between them. So, sure. In the previous slide, I'm going to you know, for example, that the, the stuff from topic two uh, is related to a particular part of the lung. So, so these are okay. So, this is coming in the next slide. Uh, but here, I'm just showing you the, the general concept. In the next slide, I'm going to show you how that is happening. So, we have a pair of imaging genetic topics on the, on the, on the population domain. And every subject that it gets its own proportion. So here again, the schematic the subject S gets more of the topic red, a little bit of topic blue, and a little bit of topic uh, green, and nothing of topic, topic purple, for example. And for each location in the lung, we have so called ideal or latent random variable that is unobserved, that is used to explain the variation in that location. So for example, this location, we assign a random variable that. So here I'm assigning value to this. So if it is green, it's getting uh, the parameters from the green topic to explain the variations in that location. Did I answer your question? Okay. And similarly for the genetic data. Together we have this uh, sure. For the genetic data, do you have a set of genes that you are only taking into consideration? So so in previous Is so, it like a SNP array data, for example? What is it? Is it like a SNP array it's data? SNP array. But I don't understand that how can you get different SNP array data for different sections of the line? No, we are, that's not what we are doing. Uh, so we are, so for, you get the SNP on the, on the subject level, right? And we want to see that whether the chance of seeing minor modification is related to something on a population level. Did I answer your question? Okay, so let me explain it then. For each individual, you get, let's say, 
a long array. So let's focus on, on some location that has been replicated and we, we want to, we know there's a really accuracy COP. Let's say five locations, okay? So in these five locations, you have an array of zero, ones, and ones for each individual. You're with me so far? Is it good? Okay, so now, it's going to change. So of course, it's going, so it's going to change according to the platform, what platform are you going to use? Right? Well, so here we are, there is a speed processing done that is, there is no change in the platform. So, like, we are all, you're using the same platform, you said, you said, there's a population of, you're using the same platform for everyone. What platform can change? Okay, so you see five uh, minor modifications for each of these. Okay, so now we want to see that. If there are change in the population, the change in, this, uh, in some of the imaging patterns can increase or decrease the risk of seeing minor and mean in this guy versus the other guy. So your chance, of, so your patterns are different than my patterns. We want to see whether these differences in the pattern in, uh, contributes to, to the chance of seeing minor and modification on, on, on our genome. We are not relating uh, genotype per location. We are saying that there is, there is, there is a, uh, so, go ahead. Yeah, but the boxes in my lung and your lung will be different. Of course. And so this is why we are, so this is why we are saying that the box, the, 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 the super boxes, yes. So we are not, we are not relating them in a, in a level of super boxes. We are relating them on a level of individual. So, we are saying that here you see this specific pattern, which is on the population level. And this is the distribution of the, of the genotype on, again, on the population level. So as a subject, you get different chances of seeing minor allele, which is also reflected in these vectors. So for example, you say that I get 40% of topic, 40% of this green guy, and a little bit of this uh, uh, red guy. Okay, so this comes with, uh, with the chance of seeing minor and mean. You don't know it, you have to discover it from the data. But that is basically what is used to explain your genome. We are not relating them on, on, the, on the box level. Did I answer your question? Is it clear? Yeah, better. Okay, so we can, we can discuss in more detail. Um, okay, so this, a uh, measure of uh, arrows and circles that you see is a way to represent this hypothesis in a statistically uh, sound way. So every arrow represents a condition of dependencies, and every circle represents random value. You have set up observed random value, which is the imaging data and the genetic data, and you have set up unobserved random value. For example, which of the pairs of C minor modification on the genotype and imaging are paired on the population? And then, on the individual level, uh, how the labels of each of these locations uh, varies among subjects. So we, we do not, so this is the, basically this, ex, this part of the graph explains the subject level proportion. This part explains the, 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 the imaging observation. This part represents the genetic observation. And we are not related, so there, there is no arrow between them, which means that they are not conjunct, but they're, they're dependent on a subject level. We are not relating them on the, on the individual superboxes. Make sense? Okay. So now, so for the people in the audience who are familiar with uh, hierarchical traditional process, it's a variant of HTP with two observations. And also in order to Ex to extract the number of the topics from the data, we, can, we make it non-parametric. We don't assume any, uh, any topic. We basically discover from the data uh, with these extra random values that we choose. Now, we can ask different questions from this model. One question that you can see is that, what is this theme? <coughs> what is the theme that co-occur across the population? So this theme would be the pattern that you see in the image or the pattern that you see on the dependent image. And this is one of the questions you can ask from uh, the model. So we uh, basically tested it in a simulated data, but I'm going to show you only the, the results of the real. So here we are applying on 2400 CT scan of the lung, and 
or uh, subdividing it into supervoxels. From each supervoxel, you get flow from histogram. And we are focusing on 32 sticks, which based on the literature that are related to COB over and to over long. So as I said, we can ask different questions from this model. So the question that we can ask from graphical model comes in a form of uh, posterior estimation. So I can say that, for example, if I say, what is the posterior probability of this random variable? So this is something that's subject specific. So it can give us the distribution of the subtypes for each, each subject. So for, for topic one, for this specific subject, the areas that are labeled as topic one are around the boundary of the lawn. And these are what my clinical collaborator would like to call the like real topic. These are specific uh, subtypes. Uh, topic two, for example, with this subject is more distributed attitude which is uh, one of the hallmarks of, of, of the centrifugal. And we also have some topics that focus on stars, airways, and other areas which looks like normal. But remember that we didn't, we didn't use uh, the input from the doctors, we derived it from the data. And we talked about topics, so how do these topics look like? Remember we use the uh, histogram as the input features. So our top is gonna look like a histogram. So I'm showing you uh, the, 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 the top four topics based on the variance of the data that they explain. So here, uh, if you are familiar with the, with the literature of uh, COPD and um, uh, basically uh, more specifically COPD and CTA scan, there are so much discussion about how can we decide about this threshold, the threshold that we use to characterize the amount of emphysema. So instead of deciding one single threshold, we, we, we derive a distribution that this distribution concentrated around the, the, the values that they usually pick up the threshold. And um, our genetic topics are harder to explain. So, so remember that our genetic uh, topics are distribution. So basically, you can build on the histogram of location that you see a chance of one or multiplication. So to interpret them, it, it's more meaningful to compare two topics with each other. So here I'm showing you, for example, six of the topics based on the amount of variance that they explain. So for example, in this location, this belongs to chromosome 14, the gene CP, CFPT1 that we know is related to COPD, but didn't get that much of uh, basically attention that like, how it is related. So you see that the chance of seeing minor early modification is higher in these two, but lower than this one. So from comparison between these imaging representation of these two patterns, we can get an idea as, as how this is the, the, the modification in, uh, uh, in this location or decrease or increase the chance of minor modification in this location manifests itself in the And uh, so there are other, for example, the one from uh, chromosome 16 from alpha 1 anti tryptin deficiency that explain only a small variance in the population. But there are different chances of uh, So just to summarize this part of the talk, remember at the beginning I said, doctors decide the subtypes visually based on the location that they, they see this uh, modification. But we didn't use that. So is it, it's interesting to return this back to, to the clinical understanding. So what we can do is that we can get this subject level uh, uh, annotation that's come from our model, align them with each other, and get the, the cloud or uh, the, the location that we see the chance of model. So here I'm showing you the, the rough location of these uh, topics for three topics across the population. So for example, the topic one is mostly distributed among the boundary of the model. The long and the other one uh, is just adding. So this is the effect that you see across the population. Make sense? So, but in a, in, a, in, a, in a nutshell, this method is a way to summarize imaging and genetic data and bring it to a lower dimension representation for summarization. It's, it's a way to do it, yes. So for the, the previous slide, there is that, for example, you got the result from something else. Yeah, so here, 
to me, this is a generative model, and a way to validate the generative model is using another variable, variable which was not part of the, the model. So in a few slides down the road, you see that we are using similar models to predict the FED1, which is the respiratory signal. So if your generative model is a good generative model, it should be, able, it should be a good predictor for uh, this clinical variable, which was not part of the study. Because if you bring it and model it, it's sort of redundant. Did that, so I'll show it, but did I answer the question last year? Cool. So, okay. So next one is going to be a little bit of ongoing work. So we talked about uh, local histogram as the most relevant information to COPD. But there's so much other information. So for example, um, if uh, if you uh, send a, a pathological sample of this patient uh, to pathology, there are texture changes. So this basically suggests that there are more information in the image that we haven't quite modeled. So, there are, so take your um, favorite texture representation, Gaber representation or Harley or whatever. More specifically, we are working on, on the representation of the, the texture, which is because we are talking about the 3D images. So, which, which is rotational invariant. Basically, for people who are familiar with the uh, history of the gradient hog, this is the 3D version of the model. But then, how, how are you going to compare these different descriptors? So, you have your own descriptor, I have my own descriptor. And let's say that we are validating this with respect to predicting the clinical value. So, we are doing a statistical analysis, and analysis, the lighting is very important. So, if one uh, descriptor performs better than the other. So you first have to ask the question that did I have a better descriptor? Is it really good descriptor? Or I didn't model, I didn't choose the good likelihood this one. So, and all of these lo different local image descriptors have their own uh, statistical properties. I'll just give you an example. If you use, for example, wavelength, the coefficient of the wavelength can become positive and negative. If you are using, for example, Harley, it's always positive. You can't choose the same likelihood for both. So now the question is that can we compare, for example, one image descriptor versus the other <coughs> one painlessly without pain? And our answer to this question is that yes. In the in expense of interpretability, you can you can sidestep the inference, the, the computation that I explained in the in the in the previous slide, and choose between the, the descriptor, and then you can go and spend time and find a good descriptor, uh, look like this. Another question that we can ask is that, what is the optimal image descriptor? But we have to answer this question, optimal with respect to what? So given that here we want to study heritability of the disease, we want to use the notion of heritability to come up with the best local image descriptor. So the following slide, I'm going to only talk about this one. So, if you write the simplified version of our model, basically we model every subject as a mixture of normal distribution, that this part was parameterizing the local image pattern, and this part was representing basically load of each of subjects for each individual. So if I want to compare one subject to another subject, I just have to compare this load from different individuals. But that requires estimating all these values that I don't know. And also, assuming this uh, uh, normal distribution, which basically equivalent to assuming the data. What we propose here is that we want to relax this assumption, substitute the normal distribution with an unknown uh, uh, function, and instead of summarizing it, some, uh, comparing different individuals, estimating the, the, the similarities or dissimilarities between each individual as a, as a, as a distance in the distribution. So, so the, there are three key observations. So first key observation is that if you have a mixture uh, of distribution, it lives in so-called statistical manifold in the, because you are summarizing a lot of information in a few parameters. And we can estimate this similarity empirically and assign index to each individual. And these values can be estimated using uh, uh, unbiased estimator called uh, unbiased estimator. So basically, for each individual, you get local representation, either patches or super voxels. 
and you represent each individual as these PIs. And the difference between you and, for example, me and you boils down to this distance that we use uh, cool back uh, divergence. The only things that we require is Kenyan state. So what do we do for? We can use the similarity between individuals to assign a multi-dimensional uh, uh, index to each individual. And then we can use uh, interesting things with this. So here are a few examples. So going back to your question that how we, how, how we do this, here on the y-axis I'm showing the R square of FEV1, this respiratory signal, and these are different image representations. Histogram, heart rate, mixture of histogram and radian, and so on and so forth. The blue is our method and green is classical k Now we can use this method to very quickly decide which image descriptor are, is the best based on how well it predicts the clinical value. We can also inter uh, uh, summarize the entire population. Here, I'm showing every dot represents one individual. I'm projecting everything in two-dimensional for sake of visualization, and color represents the severity of the disease. The, the harder the color, the more severe the sign. And you see that this is the, diver the direction of exacerbation of the disease. So what can be used here is that if the subject start in, in a longitudinal analysis, start walking from this direction to this direction, it means that it, 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 it's, a, it's a quick way to say that the disease is exacerbated. Another thing that we can do is that we can perform statistical, uh, so basically geo-wide association. So here I'm showing you the, the, the zoom in part of the Manhattan plot for chromosome 15 in a specific location, and blue represents our method, Green represents performing this uh, statistic, uh, genetic association using FEV1, and the purple represents the result using this uh, threshold by respiratory uh, value. The y-axis is a minus log of the p-value, and arrows represent the direction of the, of the genes. Both represent the same um, pattern, but uh, we are shown the higher power. So why is it important? So when you are performing genetic association with FEV1, this is the mixture of the airway disease and emphysema and multiple other things. So if you build um, image representation that only focuses on emphysema and shows in one place that there is a jump in the power, that basically suggests that that specific loci is more related to emphysema than the airway disease. So you can use this method to basically de-identify the different low sizes to see whether these are more related to emphysema or more related to airway disease. So um, that basically takes me to the future direction. So we talked about pre-engineered features. Um, our leak, um, the system of the gradient, and so on and so forth. The question is that can we use this notion of heritability to come up with an optimal representation that maximally represents, maximally captures uh, the heritability aspect of the disease. We are working on using uh, a convolutional, uh, so basic deep learning to, uh, to build this optimal feature. And this method that we have present uh, is about data fusion. So we are fusing imaging, imaging data with the genetic data. But the, the structure of the model is general and, um, and, uh, and uh, block wise that you can extract other types of information into this. For example, you can incorporate imaging, genetic data, and things like this. In fact, we are working with the uh, University of Vienna in, a, in, a, in another project that the idea here is that we have the, the radiology report and imaging information, and we want to summarize all of this information to an encapsulated to an index so that we can use it for um, uh, basically differential diagnosis. So if a patient comes to uh, a, a doctor, the system can retrieve similar subject from two years ago and say that based on the diagnosis of this person two years ago, these are the possible, uh, possible uh, di diagnosis. Do you want to change your diagnosis based on uh, what uh, we retrieve from the data set or not? And also it can be extended. So I didn't talk about the first part of the, the uh, my research about the, uh, the brain analysis, but this related to imaging and genetic data have other potential. For example, in the context of different disease um, called glioblastoma, which is a uh, brain tumor, 
there are multiple subtypes. And based on the subtypes, um, the treatment is different. But the problem is that for this specific one, this specific one to, to actually understand the subtype, we need gene expression, not the genotype data, which means that you have to access the tissue directly, which means that opening some of the stuff. So now the question is that if you can relate these two together based on retrospective data, can we subtype the disease for a new patient only on uh, using gene? working on, on another project and mostly related to the first part of my talk to uh, basically um, subtype schizophrenia based on uh, 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 structural changes including diffusion cancer imaging uh, to the underlying living model. So this is a quite multidisciplinary study um, and I'm showing a subset of uh, my collaborators that helped me in this project. And uh, if you don't want to contribute to one of my talks, uh, stop this one. Thank you. <laughs> so, how generalizable is the, uh, this uh, medical image fusion technique with clinical data to pathology? Um, I hope it's generalizable. I have to say that I don't have a direct experience with pathology images. And so um, if the general statistical uh, assumption is valid, within that domain you can apply. So which, what, what do I mean by that? So for example, if you're getting a pathology of images and there are different patterns, and you want to summarize the, the entire sample as summarization of different patterns, but you don't want to make a decision or you don't want to get the, the label from the doctor saying, hey, okay, you have to label each of these uh, different subtypes of the tissue manually, <clears throat> but we want the model to do that. If that is the target, then you can, you can use this model. So Chopper, comment on that. Yeah, I think how scalability, because I know what you're doing with spatial no, I think, uh, uh, diagnostics, it's, it seems very similar to me. No, I so think, I think I'm waiting for the day where the two of you get in a room yes. and come up with a model, a mixed model, and it's very doable. And uh, I think it's a bit more than just uh, waiting for annotation. And I think uh, the possibilities are quite a lot, even with pathology data. And having patterns is what uh, all the pattern recognition people who are pathologists sitting in the room actually do. So I think uh, lots of scope. Any uh, comments on how you? Go on about choosing K. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> so we don't we don't choose the K. So it's a non-parametric model. Yeah. We basically we allocate a bucket and yeah. say that this is the maximum bucket that you can use, and you have to use few buckets. As long as the bucket size is big enough, the model finds that optimal. So the, our model tends out to find like 21 to 22 times based on that. So we don't choose the K. About the inference. Because of the scale of this data, so the, the result that I showed was around 2,400, but we are actually having 10,000. So we are using um, basically a stochastic variation of inference that analyzes images in batches. It doesn't look the, the, the but you need a cluster to solve this. So to both of you, uh, speaking as one of the clinicians in the office, modeling still confuses the hell out of me. Uh, as much as I sit here and try to absorb it, the power of these models uh, that are fueled by both the techniques we both use are still really untouchable by most of us, particularly the pathology community, uh, probably a little less uh, in the radiology community. But there's this huge gap of understanding how these models inform these methods. So I hear your pain. Uh, the pain is we're used to looking at expression in a specific area and saying it must be different because there are different disease and tissue types. But as I understand it, these models help generalize uh, across the entire tissue space, even with single genetics tests, when applied to a population. But uh, you know, how, do we, how do we catch up the MD audience, where this could uh, really catch fire, uh, and the practicing uh, uh, translational pathologists and radiologists to understand these models? Because you know, one of the things we continue to struggle with is the cause of discovery model. This is pretty dense stuff. Under, understanding the difference between statistics and 
computational models and population models applied to individuals. How do we break through that barrier so more people know how to use this? I think Chakra has more experience, but uh, like I'm, I'm happy to comment. No, 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 not, just for, not just for pathologists. Oh, okay. You know, radiologists seem uh, uh, ahead of the curve a bit, largely because of the amount of uh, large amount of developmental funding that comes to NIVIP to the radiology community. But how do we fill the gap? Because there's this big gap between you know folks that can ask interesting problems with uh, volume volume fill uh, medical fusion data models. Uh, and you guys that understand the modeling and the statistics and the math behind this. Um, Chuck, do you want to comment uh, yeah, on the um, mic? Of course, uh, as always, had great, great questions about modeling and you know, how you fill this gap. And uh, so this is just a sort of a personal opinion. And I think uh, uh, something you said, which is that you were not. Uh, was there a very close sort of uh, interaction with the yes. radiologist when you were And that's why stuff? there was like Harvard, like I was working in Brigham right. Hospital right. with uh, pulmonaries to right. interpret these topics because, and even this assumption is coming from their hypothesis about the data. Right. I go and formalize their hypothesis, I'm not coming up with it. <laughs> and uh, in that domain, uh, did you see them being excited about this end process and what they're seeing as topics and why they make sense for them? So all of those things that I explained are yeah. basically based on inter interaction. It basically, I think this goes back to the first question that there are they they should be involved and they are involved during not only setting the parameters and not only interpreting the, the data but also in the in the in the coming up with the, the right way to uh, uh, to model this. So we don't start so we don't start with the model. So we, we basically, this is what I do, so then I'll try to answer your question then. We communicate with, uh, with, with, the, with the domain expert and we try to basically build a model that abstract their assumptions. So for example, if they say that emphysema, this is how we measure emphysema. And basically what they do is that they're counting the pixels based on intensity. And I say, okay, so what is the ge more general, general way of this counting? And what's the more general way of going from pixel to pattern? Hence, the topic model. And this is coming from the communication. This is one aspect. Uh, the second aspect is that I think part of the effort should come from us to make our model more inter interpretable. And this is why I am more like inclined to our graphical model because I can go back and interpret the results versus some other methods that harder to explain. I think in a, in a near future, there will be more effort to, to, to interpret the model and go just go beyond the prediction. And the next level would be to incorporate the, 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 the feedback. The, the, the system that directly incorporates feedback. And I think that's what makes it exciting. Just want to add a small thing and then have audience ask more. I think Mike is also probably saying that is, uh, the volume of data that's out there is humongous, and in as much as we are doing modeling, uh, we seem to be so far behind in engaging a whole lot of community to do this. And I think that we need to do a little bit more and things differently to engage that. And I think that's what Joe and Jeff might actually also add to that. Um, so, but yeah, and I think that's worth the discussion and, and serious one. Yeah. I have a very simple question and a very technical question. Right. So, simple question I probably should have asked well, immediately. Could you formally define what you mean when you say topic and when you say subject? Okay, the subject is individual. The patient. The person. Person. Okay. And the topics is the joint image pattern that comes in the form of the whatever global we just scripted that you extracted. If you extracted. Uh, is it a vector of weights? It's a vector, yes. Uh, weights. Yes. So here we are. So in the first part, we are extracting the histogram, and that histogram is basically represented as a vector. And on the genetic side, the topics is the basically is, is a vector that comes from the simplex, which is the sum to one, and that the the, the, the chance of seeing one kind of modification that. And how do you relate subject to topic? So, uh, how do we relate subject to topics? The subject have several topics. 
Yes, exactly. This is talking is an admixture of knowledge, right? The, every every subject has a different proportion. Right. That was my technical question. This is unsupervised learning. Yes. Can you show it's correlating with, with other things? <laughs> You mentioned very briefly that you're looking at using a, a new automatic feature extraction with a convolutional uh, network, right. which is supervised. Right. When, when does that happen? So our so our idea is not to use it as a supervisor. Um, I don't know how are you familiar with the, with the literature of with literature which is intersection of graphical model and decoder based variational autoencoder. You can use an auto. Yeah, we are using the graphical structure of the variational autoencoder to do this. But that would be difficult because. And so your features would be that, that piece as well. The, the general so basically, your model. observation, instead of deciding about the likelihood, you can make your likelihood as, an, as just a single case in the uh, decomp. Right? So, and the rest is the same. Yeah, that's your question? So David, let me ask you a question. I'm not talking. <laughs> <laughs> but it's sort of like a feature of the discussion. It's like from a computational structural biology perspective, do you see any methods that can be applied to these type of images like we don't for the function? Well, I mean, the first thing I would think you would more want to talk about is that you would supervise it and then you the labels. For me, for me, the issue is though is for, for the methods that I think that when you're defining the topics, the data, the data that you're collecting, the data is too limited. Yeah. Because obviously, if uh, your data collection is flawed, you, your topics will be flawed. Right? And what you're learning in genetics and genomics is that we are really in a certain way because we don't really understand the contributions of various technologies. Translation from one language to the other is a great deal of pain, right? There's a big article in the New York Times about Google translators. Well, why is that? Well, obviously, the algorithms are limited, right? But also, the structure of the language, the language A to language B, is not completely changed. It's identical. So you have a really high fidelity of data, which is in this case the virtual symbol of the language, right? What we don't have. I think it depends I'm what kind of, I think uh, I think it, it depends what kind of genomic data and imaging data you have. So I can talk only about the results. So for example, if, if you are talking about the MR imaging, and if you are going to compare the intensity of the MR imaging, I think it's limitless. Because it's limitless. If you compare the intensity of the MR, the, the change in the machine can influence it a lot. The change in, in, the, in the field strength can be a lot. So this is why that in the MR, we don't really talk that much about the intensity of, of, the, of, of the value. We talk about mostly the contrast. So there are ways to make a map out of it, but that probably needs a board class physicist to make a map which is invariant. CT is a slightly different because CT is calibrated with respect to air, so there are variations with respect to the camera, but these variations are less than what you see in the, uh, in the, in the MR. And you can say, you can talk about the range of the values that, for example, you see air. And you can, and with respect to that, and it depends on like, how far you can, you can go. Um, on a pathology, I think Chopper can pro probably be more uh, educated. Yeah, no, uh, both the micro and micro differ also here. Uh, but I think uh, the way you speak is that the ways to normalize uh, data that comes from this data provider. I don't, I wouldn't say it's a 
it's so bad. I, don't, I never, I mean, given the experience that I collect, I think there are redeemable features, and I think there's a way to fix a lot of those issues, I would say. Uh, of course, you have to have nicer and better algorithms, but I think it's doable. So I'm not so negative about devices being poor or that the data being way too dependent on the devices that it's getting these days. I think this, that might be a generation old, but not anymore. I don't see it that way. At least for the data that I do. Well, one thing, one thing that I think, so are you saying because of the generational changes and different types of genomic technology, things you discover in one model will not be scalable to the next? But remember, the idea within any one of these things is to get to a model, and it's the collection method is going to be the norm across the set of samples. You're right. You couldn't get uh, scans and genomic data from five institutions, put them in, and then be modeling against five different sets of uh, data. This has to be carefully constructed, as with any model generating activity. Uh, but I think there's a lot to be learned. Even, you know, again, I think you're already seeing the power of just a few odd studies. You can say, well, why aren't you using whole exome? Or why aren't you using next gen sequencing? That's just more detailed, higher quality data. And that doesn't destroy the model. It just adds another layer of, you know, uh, resolution to it as the technologies evolve. So any step in the matter, understanding, you know, even with primitive imaging techniques and old scanners, you should be able to develop models. They may not be as high range, but maybe several of the large macros. And if you think about genetic data, it's not really very high range. It's dozens of features per disease probably. Maybe, you know, up to 100. But certainly not thousands, hundreds of thousands. And the resolution is only going to help us in this feature set in getting deeper into specific diseases. So some of these techniques may be totally useless for uh, one disorder, but extremely high resolution because of uh, the simplicity of the model of things like COPD or uh, some diseases where you know there's a pretty defined genetic content. Now, what I'm also excited about is what, as the high resolution goes, goes on, we may discover other new biomarkers. But you know, I, again, if, if you're talking about the mismatch between different types of imaging techniques and different genomic techniques and just generalizing them, I think you're right. Uh, there'll be a lot of money. But if you take a standardized data set, all on the same platform, you live with the resolution you have, the models help tease out what you can see with that model. It may not be fully featured yet, but at least it should be valuable. The problem is, <coughs> a, lot of, a lot of the studies out there use no form of modeling to actually come to conclusions and do a lot of correlational stuff and take the complexity of multiple types of inputs. So I'm a big believer that a lot can be gained even with low resolution techniques if the right kind of model is applied, which may tease out one set of feature set. And as the as we evolve to larger, more high brain and higher resolution data sets, the model should be very informative uh, as we move across it at each stage. I mean, is that I think also, like, there, there is also a slight difference that these study is a research quality data. And there is, I think, I, I can talk about the radiology part, not quite the technology, but the, the gap between even the tools that you can apply, ap apply to the data which is acquired for research purposes and the, the data acquired for clinical purposes. So there are very long chain of view processing that I really didn't talk about. But even like as a personal experience, uh, so we spent maybe 20 years developing uh, on, on, a, on a context of the brain to come up with an algorithm that works for research data that we can identify different regions of the brain and tag them uh, quickly. So 20 years of work falls apart if you apply this on the clinical quality data for a patient that come uh, with a stroke, no chance that you can apply uh, research quality sequence uh, on this side. So you have to scan quickly, quickly. So we have to adapt our algorithm to a new data. But I guess we need, we need to explain that this is, a, this is a research. So we have to spend time to build it for, I would say, a simpler case. Now we can move it to a more complicated clinical domain. I think some of the tools that we have 
We have developed on the, on, on the recent quality data, can be applied in the following year with minor modification to the, uh, the clinical quality data, such as the example. In Jordan, I think the beginning of this competition is probably encouraging some of these adaptations to happen. So they, can, they put some dirty data for you to say, you know, how to do it. So hopefully that will happen. So we can really all just have to be because they've got a digital platform that is useful for research and clinical studies that is shareable, but has <coughs> a set of standards around it. And that's what pathology needs to get on board and follow the path of radiology. Put that to put that kind of like wrappers around the way pathology images are wrapped uh, and make them standardized to some extent. And today it's still a lot, a lot less. You've got one vendor, you've got one methodology, you've got one set of uh, confounding factors, uh, and they're immediately not shareable. And hopefully, uh, this next decade we'll get to the kind of standardization uh, somewhere along the way. I'm going to insist on you guys putting some set of these medical teaching data sets. Uh, pathology and radiology images because I think there's pure gold in that space. We just have to figure out how to do that locally. I have a question about that because in radiology, right? And actually, it's funny because I'm in radiology and I can't do it for you, but I feel a lot better. Here. You must be an expert then. <laughs> <laughs> because experts uh, never feel what they have as good as I, I think I, I think in clinical radiology. But in terms of the rad hat question, one of the notes that gave me, if you took um, autopsy images, or autopsy data and imaged it, would that help get closer to this rad hat correlation or not? And the problem with that are numbers. And that's my other question. Numbers? Mm -hmm. Your numbers are low, and so is pediatric. So how do you deal with it? Okay, so, so, how do you, so, we, so my two questions are, would autopsy material you give rad hat? Like high resolution DPI on 17 to 24 hours, and then look at some physical pathology. Would that help answer this question? It's obviously not going to be the most terribly easy to capture the resolution of this stuff. So let me put it in the specific context of a specific disease, and then maybe yeah. let it like try. So that's my personal opinion. Um, but first of all, I think that the number, if you're talking about the number of subjects, uh, and whether a specific method needs a large number of subjects to work, I think that always depends on what the statistical question you want. So, if, for example, if you want to identify different tissue, uh, different specific samples from the same subject may give you a good predictor, so the sample size is one. Um, so, this is like, so to, to answer this question, that you always need a large number that always depends on your question. Whether, so the second question that's like, what about this radiology pathology? Um, I think there are, um, there are a lot of opportunities. And given that I don't know enough about pathology, I, won't, I can give you one example. So I think I was like, you know, involved in the project about uh, Uh, basic prostate cancer. And uh, the idea was that, okay, so men have a high likelihood of getting prostate cancer, and uh, if they all live long enough, they all get a prostate cancer, but is it actionable? Do we need to remove the prostate or do something aggressive? Uh, or no, the person may die for a different reason, we don't need to react. So then the, the, the target was, if you have a sample, uh, uh, if you have like basic biopsies, uh, can we map the biopsies? So, I mean, like, we basically can get the biopsies sent to pathology, and we also have a multi channel imaging uh, from the process. Can we map the pathology, uh, uh, the sample of the pathology, to the imaging signatures from the using retrospective data and learn that from those subjects? The action is what is actionable. So um, I think it's a pretty tough problem. Uh, it's a tough problem because, first of all, we are talking about different scales. The pathology is, is like is a, is a, the small scale, radiology is the bigger scale. Mapping them is challenge number one. So 
even if you remove the entire gland, um, based on the work of the colleagues in Harvard, I can say that even reducing this back, the entire like, lump of the gland, gland back to the, the anatomy is a pretty difficult task. So do we have a tool? I don't think so. Uh, can we do it? I think it depends on uh, the, the project that you're talking about. Like, I think for now we have to, um, I don't believe that there, is a, there would be a tool that does everything. Uh, so we have to, it, it depends on the clinical question. Well, we're also cleaning up doctors' MRIs. So in terms of the anatomy, and so the anatomy that you're talking Yeah, so, that's yeah. You know, and, and this is a technology that needs to be in the right? So, I don't know, that's why I was. Yeah, that's. With the rat pack question. Yeah, I would see a huge like a specimen radiographs so that people, you know, like my breast samples. If I wanted to do really good correlation problem tasks from the mammogram, you know, high density specimen, then there's a, um, you know, a specimen radiograph, then there's a second kind of specimen radiograph. Because then you can look at translation between in vivo radiographic appearance and the next day radiographic And these are this again, so you know, probably we also have alternative images of the eyes that are just starting to play in the new one across the field. I'm curious if you compare these results to what you get out of this regulative model. Uh -huh. So what is your label on this? I don't know most of the words that we use in this presentation, so I'm not sure how to uh -huh. answer that question. But if you, if you have to use this regulative model, I know you don't have a label for it. Right. So, so let me, so, so here is what we did. Um, we tried to use uh, the, the set of genetic markers that I showed you uh, and build the, the forward model of the CNN model to predict the gene and we failed. We failed, maybe somebody else. And, and we failed two reasons. Uh, first of all, this is 3D images. And uh, so, CN, so just applying the technology of the CNN using 3D images, you need the big cluster that you have to first build a platform that you, you, there are different GPUs talking to each other and doing optimization in mapping. That we did this at the beginning. And then, but the main problem was that, and this is also present here, that the, the image signal is so weakly related to the GPU. And and I think even the topic that you see here is mostly driven by the not by the genetics. So this is why we are rethinking the problem that maybe we shouldn't use the 30 to few alleles. We have to use the aggregate level related, basically kinship pictures, to encode the, the similarities, and that should be the way that we influence the topic. So so that so again this is Problem is specifically about the genotype data, it's like very, uh, weak effect, sorry. Okay. Thank you, speaker. Uh, thank you.